Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Gravity Falls, Season 1, Episodes 6 through 10. And I'm still a little raspy. I apologize. <laughs> uh, I think he's just using it as an excuse to let me gush over the show since for me it's a first impression and for him it's a rewatch. Very enjoyable rewatch. There's a lot going on here. I mean, to the point where by the time we finished episode 10, I wasn't entirely able to remember episodes 7 and 8 for a minute because it was just info dump. Which was crazy because I really liked episode 7. But to go in order, episode 6 with two parallel storylines. Mabel working with Grunkle Stan to try to get the girl. And Dipper trying to work on being a man with the Manadors. Mm -hmm. And there was that great spot at the beginning of the episode where he goes to squeeze the thing and you think he might get higher than Wimp, but nope, Wimp. And he gets the certificate to prove it. Mm -hmm. That was painful. Yep, and then there's that one guy, Pinky, barely pushes it, blows up the machine. Which wasn't very nice because now they have to repair or replace the machine. And some of these people, this, the names seem so odd. A lazy Susan. And so is her nickname that she's lazy or is her actual name Lazy Susan? Is it because she has the air quotes lazy eye? Or is it because a lazy Susan is a turntable for in the kitchen area, usually with your desserts on it or your snack tray? I don't know. I can't really remember much. Also, I wouldn't say anything if I did. <laughs> Yes, but this goes back again to Mabel being astute when it comes to people's feelings towards each other. Mm, that's a good way to put it. Because she was like, oh, yeah, because Stan wasn't being that flirtatious. Also, how are these kids alive? A cup of dressing and a plate of ketchup, and they wanted to go to the diner. That implies that Stan had bought them actual food at the diner at some point. Mm. Because otherwise they would know... That they would be doing like a three-way split on it. Actually, I think it was a four-way split on a number seven. It was it like one quarter plate of a number seven and a side of dressing for the ladies. Specifically, Mabel gets a cup of dressing and Dipper gets a plate of ketchup. And I think it's a three-way split because uh, it was only Uncle Stan, Mabel, and Dipper. Yes, but I think he only ordered a portion of the plate itself. Yeah, he ordered yeah. a split plate. Usually that would be two different things together. No, he just wanted half the plate. No, normally a split plate is a single menu item put on two different plates so that two people can share it. And a lot of restaurants do a split plate charge, and other places don't allow split plates. Mm. So there was all of that chinancery on his part, plus the whole dynamic between him and Lazy Susan, Mabel's attempts at a makeover, and her realization of, wait a minute, no, this is exactly how it should be. I'm like, Mabel, in what circumstances do you let your grunkle out of the house without pants? I was just going to say, you can even leave the house without your pants. He goes, I'm all for it. Like, no, just no. Mm-hmm. And then Dipper with the Manators. And the first one who showed up, that guy was pretty cool. I mean, he was nice. He was willing to listen to Dipper. Was in tune enough to recognize, oh, man, you're having issues. Okay, let's talk. But then you get back to the man cave. And everyone's a stupid, hyped up, overly masculine idiot. Yeah, overly stereotypical American masculine idiot, to be precise. Yes. What people seem to have in their head of what a real man is. I'm like, nope. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'll pass. I like my Icelandic pop music. Yep. And yes, sometimes a girly pop song will come on the radio. I'll leave it because, you know, they're in the top 40 for a reason. They're catchy. <laughs> I do like ABBA. Yeah, enjoyable. And just how direct ripoff all of their music is. Their Icelandic group and the way they do the lyrics, it's so obviously a take on Dancing Queen. And then moving forward to the party episode, everything that Mabel and Pacifica were doing. I mean, Mabel's was a direct ripoff of Don't Stop Believing. And it was just awesome. And she was awesome. She's like, well, I'll compete. 
because Mabel has few filters. Mm -hmm. I love her new friends, too. Yes. Awesome. I would like to see them again. I don't think we've seen them since then. Mm, nope. I don't think so. That was really one of my favorite episodes so far because Dipper was literally getting in his own way. And not in the usual, oh, the clones are going to take over and take my place. They didn't turn on each other until the very end. When Dipper changed the plan because he grew a little. Yes, and because that was an experience that wasn't shared by any of the clones, they didn't have the context to see that what Dipper was saying actually made sense. All they saw was, oh, you are the original, but you're no longer acting like yourself. Therefore, we appoint us to take over. Mm -hmm. I was like the part of like, what would you guys do if you were uh, trapped in a closet? Break out. Yes. And also how nice they were. They're like, yeah, there's some snacks and a coloring book for you. Until the very end, even when they were trying to get rid of him, they didn't want to hurt him. You know, they didn't try to kill him. They broke a lot of tropes, but they also included the classic trope of one of the clones is bad. As in, doesn't come out quite right. Yes, uh, paper jam dipper. I'm surprised that wasn't worth a mercy killing right there. A uh, spray bottle of water, because really, what kind of existence is that? Yeah. Oof. And then just the ending. That was so sad. It's like, really, you guys, are, no, Tyrone, don't drink the soda. Yeah, you kind of just don't think about it. Then you realize, oh, yeah. No, as soon as they said that, I'm like, no, no, he's going to drink the soda. And at least he dies by, well, that's technically suicide. He dies by his own hand. You know, really? They could have just photocopied the soda. But, hmm. Interesting. If they take the full can before they open it and photocopy it, it wouldn't affect him. Because it would be a photocopy version, and it would probably be safe. Because I like the concept, so I don't want to tear it apart too deeply, but, you know, you have all the things of, okay, he's laying on the copier. The copier's only getting the back of him. How is it actually copying all of him? Also, how are they three-dimensional? Magic McGuffin, who probably lives in that town. Yeah, probably, because jumping to episode 10, they're willing to admit when something's only 2D. Mm -hmm. The Street Fighter 2 ripoff of uh, Ken slash Ryu. Not just Street Fighter 2. They did a lot in that episode. They referenced a lot. They did, but the character specifically looks like Ken and is... Uh, Ryu, actually. Ken was a duplicate of... Ryu. Yeah, but Ken was the blonde. So, looks like Ken acts like Ryu. Yeah. Uh, let's backtrack a little to Pioneer Day. Wow. That was a lot of silliness. Quite. Ah, poor Stan. Yes. Trapped in town on Pioneer Day. I don't feel like we got the full picture of why he hates Pioneer Day so much. Mm-hmm. I mean... Sounds a little bit like he's not into the role-playing, but I'm sorry. He could be a snake oil salesman in any era. What, he can't still rip them off on Pioneer Day? You'd think it'd be easier because all of his oddities and mysteries would be more odd and more mysterious. Mm -hmm. And to stay in character, they would have to <laughs> fall for it even worse than they normally do. I also love the, um, you're a mechanic! What is this thing you call a car? It's like, yeah. <laughs> this is why I hate Pioneer Day. Uh, and Gideon with the tomatoes and everyone else with the tomatoes. But I'm with Stan. Uh, impressive that he wrote that with his mouth. And even though he got hit with the tomatoes after that, I would go, worth it. Totally worth it. I think me and you would just pretend we were an episode of Star Trek where we went back in time. <laughs> reference check? If you get the reference, put it in the comments. A link. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was also nice that when they did the whole Pacifica's family isn't the founder of the town, they didn't turn around and make it the Pine family. Yeah. Because... That's kind of where the trope goes. Oh, it's not really the popular girl. It's the unpopular girl. And it was the whole time. And here now we have the proof. No, instead we have this crazy wackiness with the eighth and a half president. 
which is awesome. I like the eighth and a half prison. He's actually a nice guy. He's just a little too wacky for his own good. Yeah, really my only complaint in that entire thing, surprisingly, is about him appointing babies to the Supreme Court. Yes, the president gets to nominate the appointments, but they are debated by Congress. There's no way that would have actually happened. And yes, I know I'm talking factual happenings in a mystery slash sci-fi show aimed at children. Hmm, it's more fantasy than sci-fi. Time travel episode. Yeah, but that still doesn't make it um, sci-fi. Sci-fi is defined by you following the strict rules of science, just future extracted. This is more of a fantasy universe where anything's possible as long as it can be roughly explained. Yes. We're going to have to look into that peanut brittle thing. <laughs> mm. And I think that was the episode where I enjoyed the police officers the most. Because in the first five episodes, they were kind of both idiots and jerks. Mm. But in this one, they were a little more high caliber. There was some really nice interaction between the two of them. You know, showing a depth of respect for each other, also friendship for each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it makes me wonder, okay, were they acting like dumb rural cops because they've been on this mission? Lux won't give me any hints. <laughs> of course not. Also, I've forgotten most of the stuff I knew. <laughs> uh, and I'm refraining from looking at Wikipedia, even though I want to do that to check out the ciphers because I haven't been playing back the audio in the beginning in reverse, or pausing to look at the end credits to get the cipher there. It's not the cipher there. The cipher is at the beginning. The cipher is the thing you use to decode the message. We're talking about the encoded message at the end during the credits. Yes, so I haven't been getting the ciphers or the clues. Thank you. <laughs> I just thought I'd be a little bit more precise and exact there because, you, you know, they would come out of the woodwork. Some science geek would go, some encryption geek would go, No, that's not correct! Hey, we'd get a comment. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, th thank you for the comments we do have. Thank you for the subscribers we actually interact with. Yay! <laughs> no, and we get to see that the eighth and a half president is a really nice guy. He orders them to forget a it all ever happened, but he doesn't tell them, go back to Washington. He doesn't tell them to go kill themselves. He doesn't tell them to go turn themselves into jail. He says, go have a nice vacation. Also, Magical MacGuffin, that Dipper has that key. Mm -hmm. That's going to come into play a lot, especially if it does actually work the way the eighth and a half president said. Mm -hmm. Also, Mabel, as an air quotes, official congressman, officially pardoning Stan. Which works. <laughs> yes, surprisingly well. Mm -hmm. Uh... A poor Dipper, losing Wendy. Not like he ever had a chance, but at least while she was single, he could dream. Mm-hmm. Also, I thought Wendy was smarter than that. Did you notice that Wendy's like, eh, just kind of hanging out with him? Yeah. To her, I don't think it really changes the status quo of what's going on, other than maybe she gets to kiss more. Yeah, because she's like, yeah, why not? Which is not the normal response. But still, it's a status update. Ugh. A nice use of time travel there, and nice that they didn't waste any explanation time on how time travel works. It's like, nope, this is the thing. And that set up at the beginning of the episode that there's no way you're going to get dunked unless like someone from the future with a space arm laser. So of course they say that in the beginning of the episode, and you know it's going to happen by the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. Especially once they introduce a time traveler. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of the thing, is they tell you something in the beginning. And then it unfolds. So they basically tell you what they're going to do, and then they do it. Yeah, and did you catch that he's actually in several other episodes? Well, they were showing the footage of him going back and fixing everything. I'm like, great, now I need to go back and rewatch those episodes. Because these guys would have done work well enough that I should be able to see him in all of those situations. Mm -hmm. And that was also another example of how Dipper is really, you know, just a nice guy. Especially once they found out how devastating it would be to Mabel. Mm-hmm. And they use time travel again to to illustrate how miserable Mabel would actually be. 
Yes, because I was initially siding more with Dipper, like, no, she'll totally forget about this. Ooh. And then, of course, as soon as they show him go a day later and she's still upset, I'm like, okay, she's not going to get over this. And then he keeps going further and further ahead. And he's like, ooh, great. Now I'm a jerk. So I can have a chance at my dream girl and make my twin miserable, or I can lose my dream girl and my sister will be happy. Nice guy. Though my workaround for hitting Wendy with the baseball would have been to give her the baseball, pay with the ticket, and then let her go for the throw. Also, have the ice on hand. That's another thing that just popped in my head. If you know what's going to happen anyways, make sure you're the one who has the ice. So you already have the ice, you throw it, and then, oh, Wendy, here, before he shows up and goes, oh, Wendy, here. Mm -hmm. Solution right there. Yeah. Or, oh, I don't know, throw the ball and then put a catcher's mask on her face real quick. Uh, those things are made to protect from flying baseballs. But I know it's more the thing for the guy to win the girl the prize, but she's older. She's probably stronger. Why not let her throw for it? Well, I bet you she would have ended up throwing for it for herself if it wasn't for that whack. Yeah. And then, oh my goodness, with that video game episode. All of those game cabinets, just such copies of the real games. And for Zeus to try to go inside Tron of all things. Tron. Oh, I missed that. I, I knew he was playing a Tron video game, but I didn't realize he went into the same cabinet. Oh my god, I missed that. Help, I'm trapped inside the video game. I get that now. I get it even more than I did. Oh, uh, and then Dipper finding the power-up code. I'm surprised they didn't just directly rip off the Konami code. Even though Street Fighter is in Konami, is it? Yeah, it is. No, Mortal Kombat's no, Konami. No, Street Fighter's Capcom. Yeah, Street Fighter's Capcom. Konami, I believe, was Mortal Kombat. Okay, where is my copy of Mortal Kombat? Actually, I think Mortal Kombat's a claim. Okay, where's my other copy of Mortal Kombat? I was going to say, why not ask your phone? Because I have a shelf full of video games right here. I could have sworn I had a Mortal Kombat game for the Genesis. Hmm. Must have ended up with the ones that disappeared. See. Midway. Oh. So Mortal Kombat was Midway. So neither one was Konami, but the Konami code's so classic. Actually, it's probably so classic that there's actually a fee for directly ripping it off. <laughs> but yes, put in a code. Ultimate power up. Oh my goodness, I brought the video game character to life. And it's playing by video game character rules. <laughs> I had yeah. to put the taco on the floor before he could eat it. That was awesome. Also, all the random item weapon pickups. Mm -hmm. Wow, this street's junk is dangerous. And the nice classic throwing of the sign, mm -hmm. the parking sign. And the classic finish him, Mortal Kombat. Or that guy's poor car. Yeah, oh my god, I was dying at that point. Because I really suck at that bonus level. Also, notice the movie used, which was the um, sumo wrestlers. Yeah, that was E Honda's flying palm move. <laughs> which I spammed. Also, Chun Li's leg kick. Spinning bird kick. Uh, I thought this one where she flips up upside down. I'm talking oh. about the really fast one she does. Oh, the really fast one, yeah. I tended to use Cammy more for that. Ah. I had the version of Street Fighter 2 that had the extra four fighters. Ah. I think it's called Alpha or something. But back to Gravity Falls, which was named so because he fell off of a cliff. Yes. Gravity Falls. Makes sense. Perfect sense. The only part that doesn't make sense is why people live there. Hmm. I mean, really. And also, just, sorry, the video game references in this are insane. The bad translation, the nonsensical catchphrases. Donkey Kong. Yeah. And the fake out of. Well, if he's not the final boss, then you must be the final boss. And all those dramatic poses and... Mm -hmm. I was like how Dipper held up two pieces of black wood. <laughs> and how Zeus was like waving his hand in front of the life bar. 
Well, that was worth a shot. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, it's trying to erase the life bar. <laughs> but, you know, after Dipper got KO'd, I was really ready for it to his health bar to go back up and round two instead of game over. The so game over was awesome because, yeah, game over. Bye-bye. Also, the part with Robbie and Dipper, their actual fight when they got around to it, did not go how I was expecting. Dipper looked way more beat up than Robbie. So I was really expecting that Robbie was going to be going in for that punch and up walks Wendy and Robbie is dead meat. And I asked this to Ember before the recording, but I'm going to ask it again now. That thing about girls. <laughs> uh, surprisingly very true. Girls tend to uh, be more passive aggressive in their hatred. If you're another girl, you're pretty much going to know if another girl hates you, but not necessarily anyone else is going to know. Ah. Which may also tie into sometimes why guys are clueless when girls really just aren't into them. It's too subtle. Yeah, I'm also thinking that's mostly because the guys are like thinking with a certain part of their anatomy and nothing else. I'm like, dude, you're not going to get with her. Trust me on that. How do you know, man? I have a chance. In heck. Yeah. And plus side for Dipper, not that he has much of a chance. That it's not much of an age gap once you're like in your 20s. But when you're in your teens, that's a huge age gap. Also, dude, you're only 12. You're like barely thinking about girls. And going back to the party episode, I love how his fantasy, he was taller. That was very nice. Mm -hmm. I also love how Zeus was like, how to be a... How to do a DJ right. right. <laughs> yeah, he, he did a surprisingly good job being the DJ. And the end credits. <laughs> Thundershock. Found it. <laughs> yes. And Mabel, Mabel, Mabel. Tricking your grunkle Stan like that to get him up onto the water tower. Not nice at all. And more proof that Stan is a nice guy, at least when it comes to family, is he knew what Mabel was up to. He was like, yeah, this is pretty much what I thought it was going to be. But he went along with it anyways. Especially since he probably knew as he was climbing up the ladder what was going on. Yeah, there wasn't any other way to get up the water tower than the ladder. So even if he wasn't positive before he had to be positive by then and this is at least the second time he's gone along with mabel's insanity because the makeover thing back in episode six so surprisingly indulgent for a crusty old shyster can i scratch myself now no so it's a nice touch that he's now over his fear and mabel is now petrified though well, she managed to get down yeah but they didn't actually show how mm -hmm. Uncle Sam might have just carried her. I do like how he realized it. It's like, oh. I was like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I thought it was going to be. No, no, I was talking about how at the end he was like, what, you're now afraid of heights? He goes, oh, you are. <laughs> like, yeah, for him, that was a positive experience because he went through a scare and survived it. And for her, she wasn't afraid. So now she had a scare and she's traumatized. But yeah, that was a somewhat traumatizing experience. So I'm really enjoying it. In a way, I can't wait to be done with the series. Because then I can go onto Wikipedia and look up all the ciphers and clues and stuff that I've been missing. Because I haven't been pursuing them very diligently. So I know what I'm seeing casually is just a tiny amount of it. For example... I'm not paying attention at all, apparently, because it took me till episode 8 for it to click that the mystery shack, when it loses the letter S, says mystery hack, and that coincides with the time that Stan is posing for the camera. Oh, you mean in the intro? Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of clues in the intro, and I'm not just talking about the very last couple of frames. Yeah, no, there's the very last couple of frames. There's that right there. There's the Bigfoot. There's a lot of stuff in the photographs and in how they show each character 
Mabel with her plug-in light-up sweater, Dipper exploring in that skeleton, you know, the group all together around the campfire, Stan with that fake eye patch. It's a lot going on here. And this has been our thoughts on Gravity Falls, Season 1, Episodes 6 through 10. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this, please consider subscribing, leaving a comment, and checking out other videos. If you'd like to see more of Lux's art, you can check him out on DeviantArt, Tumblr, and Twitter. If you'd like to support this channel financially, please check out Patreon and Coffee, and check commission availability.